Tay, it's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You know, I got to say, as I've read this book, it's very intimate detail of your guys' life. And uh, actually, as I was reading, I felt like I was going through the good times and the really hard times. What was the decision to write this book after the movie was produced? You know, I think that there's so much more. I realized that when you're going to put your life story into a book or a movie, there's no way to hit it all. There's no way to get all the nuances. You just sort of paint the broad strokes. And there were a few things that we heard back from people. One is that they wanted more about the wives because there were a lot of women out there and a lot of men out there too who wanted more of that story Mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. Some of them it was because they wanted to be able to relate more. They wanted to understand more. They liked who Chris was on the battlefield, who he was off the battlefield. And some of them wanted more of the man behind all of that at home. And so it just ended up being a response to a lot of people's feedback. Yeah. You know, and, and as when you start to read the book, I mean, the first thing that jumps off the pages is that you, you chose four very specific words, love, war, faith, and renewal. What are the significance of those four words? You know, I think what I'm learning is that really that is a theme for pretty much everyone's life. Mm. You know, we all are seeking love no matter who we are. And in some way, right? Like right. we might, you know, sort of deceive ourselves into thinking, oh no, we don't, we, we don't need that or whatever. But there, there's a part of us that is seeking that in some part of our lives, whether it's in a traditional sense or a non-traditional sense, mm-hmm. then all of us have a war in, in our lives. There's nobody that doesn't go through life with some sort of struggle. Mm-hmm. And then the faith, it, there are a lot of different things that people can put their faith into, but I think that's part of human nature too. And Probably the most significant part of all of it for me is learning about renewal. I I really, I think I wanted it to be a destination. You know, I wanted it to be something I could find and grasp. And what I'm learning is that it's just kind of a constant cycle. Yeah, I wanted to kind of chronologically as you go through the book, one of the things that really stood out to me is um, your... You, 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 you share about how the fear of Chris being downrange and, and the emotion behind that. And then also at the same time feeling like for his sake and what he was facing, needing to keep back that emotion of fear. Uh, what would you say to the, to the wife of a soldier who's downrange for her and that emotion of and just the fear? Um, what would you say to them in, in the moment of kind of dealing with that? And yet at the same time, knowing that this is reality uh, uh, facing that. It's a good question. and I've been fortunate to talk to a lot of first responder wives too when we've been out Mm. traveling. And I think there's one thing I learned in my life with Chris is that he knew how to live a more fearless life. That didn't mean reckless. It meant fearless. And my journey has been one to figure out how to not be so afraid because really it's not in our control. Mm. It's not. And even the things that we think are in our control and we try every day to keep something in our control in a way that makes us feel safe, it's really an illusion anyway. Mm -hmm. We don't, we can only do our best and let the rest play out the way it will. And I think when you're worried about somebody's life on the line, it's very, very difficult to admit to yourself that ultimately you have no control of that and to be at peace with it. Mm -hmm. So all I can say is that I feel like you just have to know that for me, I get it from my faith. I have to know that whatever comes my way, I'll survive. Mm-hmm. You know, until I'm dead, whatever else comes my way, I will survive it. And so it doesn't do any good to be afraid. You know, and you, you touch on faith a, a lot in this book and the journey of that. How did that play into this overall journey that you've been on? I've I've grown so much in my faith and I was raised in church, but it, a lot of the things that I learned growing up were probably more in theory or didn't really sink in, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. I just, I always felt a, a relationship with God, but I didn't know the Bible as well as I could have. I didn't understand the meaning of all the archaic language and all that. And I think what I learned with Chris is that really there's so much of the Bible that's applicable to today. And it's like my dad said that it's not a book that you have to follow to get into heaven if that's your goal, but it is a recipe for happiness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I find I use it more than anything. My faith is to say, help me be happy because that's, 
you know, it's probably my biggest struggle these days is mm. help me be happy with my life because it wasn't what I wanted. And, and I've got a lot of things that I want with my kids and my friends and mm-hmm. all of that. But it, it sort of humbled me to say it didn't matter how hard I tried. It didn't matter what I put into it. I wasn't going to get the results that, that I thought I could achieve by just working hard enough. And so I find the only thing that gets me through is faith. If I didn't have it, I truly don't think that I would be able to move forward. I really don't. And I need friends to encourage me in it. And they do in, in a way that I feel like is healthy because we can still laugh about it. We can still gripe about it. We can still be confused by it. But at the end of the day, they can always pull me back to the center. Mm-hmm. And that that helps me feel like it doesn't matter what comes my way next. Because there's yeah. always somebody coming at me. Right, I mean, right. You know, and, and the rest of us too. I'm no different. I feel like all of us are just almost like, what's coming next? What's next? next? <laughs> your shoulder, like, you know? So true. You know, the, the uh, I want to touch on, and you do a, a phenomenal job of bringing us into your relationship with Chris and uh, an unbreakable bond of love that you guys shared together and yet also the the, the true reality of the struggles that you guys went through. Um, can you tell me, you, you, you mentioned several times just uh, how close that you know, kind of divorce was knocking at the door and what did that feel like and how did you guys get to the other side? You know, I think that that's, again, I think it's a common theme for a lot of us today because it's, we can say all we want, divorce is not an option, but we know it is. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the fear that I felt in those moments too were wake up calls. If, if we were on the brink of that, it was time for us to, to look at something deeper than our daily troubles because we did love each other and we did get into this life that most people wouldn't get into because you know, yeah. it's chances are you're not going to make it, but you yeah. do it because you love that person enough and, and you feel strongly enough that you'll, you'll get through it. So I think, the times when we were on the brink of it, which weren't, honestly, we talk about our struggles, but there were probably only twice that I remember legitimately having a discussion with him. Like, are, are we, we going to make it? Are we? Yeah. Are we yeah. going yeah. to make a decision for us or are we going to make a decision to quit? Yeah. And mm-hmm. Chris used to say that it was just that neither one of us or that we both didn't quit at the same time. Mm. And I thought that's probably pretty true. Um, but I, I find that there were a couple things that helped me. One is, that I could look forward and say that I wanted to be an old woman next to my old man with a bunch of grandkids around a Christmas tree. And that, that keeping my eye on that long goal was, was reason enough to get through whatever it was that day. Mm-hmm. And the other thing was that our kids, to me, I wanted to be able to look back and say, I, I cared enough about them to to do whatever it took. I'm Mm -hmm. tough enough. I'm strong enough. I will fix it somehow. And I know Mm -hmm. it's never just one person who fixes it, but I also know that you have to be willing to be pretty introspective and and cop to your own mess, you know, to, to be brave enough to look at yourself and say, yeah, I just, I, I could sit here and say I'm trying and I'm doing and but at the end of the day, you have to be brave enough to look at yourself and say, it doesn't matter because it's not working. Yeah. So well said. I think so many of us struggle with that. I mean, just day to day life and in relationship, and yet that long term perspective is so valuable. In the, right, the and you know, it. there's there's another thing I talk about in American Wife, but it's something I was just having a conversation with a friend the other day, and they have a great marriage, but they're just frustrated with each other. Mm-hmm. You know, they've got four kids and they're busy, and all the kids are going, and they're tired, and you know, I mean, yeah, they're, life. And I I gave her a tidbit that I gotten from a very good friend of mine. And she said, the time when you want to go on a date with your spouse, the least is the time you need it the most. Wow. I love you know? that. It did. It stuck with me because I thought, boy, isn't that true? Cause the times that she would say that to me, where I'd be like, are you kidding me? You want me to go plan a date <laughs> right now? Why don't he do something? You know what I mean? Right. Like, right? And, and I think that's a common feeling that we all have, but the truth of the matter is I trusted my friend enough to say, okay, I'll plan the date. And sure enough, you know, you call your spouse and say, Hey, are you up for doing this tomorrow night? I got a babysitter set up, you know, nine times out of 10, they're going to say, 
Yeah, absolutely. And you come back and all of a sudden the rest of the stuff melts away because you mm. got back to just being together. Yeah. You know, you, you talk about in your book, um, finding about the near death experience of Chris after the fact. Uh, mm -hmm. What emotional toll did that take on you? And, and, and knowing that it happened, you know, years be, be, um, before when you actually realized the severity of what was taking place? You know, it's a good question. I, I'll never really truly understand. I don't think how my emotions were at the time because it was, they were too big and too much, mm -hmm. but I knew I always wanted to know in the moment because my imagination really was, um, I think somewhat informed and somewhat realistic. So I knew he was in gunfights every day. Mm -hmm. I, I paid attention to enough of the details to know it was ugly and it was scary. And I didn't want him to feel like he had to keep those secrets to protect me for two reasons. One is I wanted to protect him. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to be able to say, be a safe place for him and to, to help us keep that bond. Because I think one of the hardest things with first responders and military spouses is that one person in the relationship is living in an entirely different universe. You can't visit it. You can't go and have a day to, to meet all the coworkers and, you know, go to a Christmas party in the offices so you can see where they work. You know, you might meet with the other guys, but there's so much lacking in that understanding that I wanted the details. And yet I could appreciate that it was an act of love for him that he didn't share in the moment. Mm. Now, sometimes he did. I mean, sometimes he'd call and he'd say, baby got real ugly today. Or like, um, you know, when, when his friends died, I mean, I, those are the calls where you can't reach through the phone line, but you can feel your partner's heart breaking. I could hear mm. him crying. It's, it's powerless, hmm. you know, trying to help somebody that far away. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, the, what comes to mind is that there's one mission, but two worlds apart in terms right. of what you guys were going through. Um, right. And what, I, what, yeah. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just saying, I just, I had the opportunity to talk to a, a veteran today and he was, he's getting ready to deploy and I know his wife very well. And mm -hmm. he was saying that I asked him if he was ready and how he felt about it. And he says, as strange as this might sound, sometimes I feel more normal over there than I do here. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's just, there wouldn't be time enough in a text or a phone call to get through to the bottom of all of that. But what I could at least do is you know, assure him that, that he's not alone in that feeling yeah. and that he has a very strong sense of purpose and a very clean, defined line of what he's there to do, not muddied by if the grass is, you know, mm -hmm. mowed and if mm -hmm. the kids have everything they need. When you're that focused on a powerful mission that has no, you know, no doubt what you're there to do, I think that's something that most men, especially, but most people would find great peace mm. in saying in this crazy world with all this stuff coming at us, if you gave us, you know, a month of just, all you have to do is eat, sleep, and do this. Mm -hmm. And mm. you're successful and you're saving lives and you're protecting something big. You know, who wouldn't feel in some ways whole in that right. environment? Right, right. You, you touch and uh, you talk about in your book, there was a time when Chris shared with you that if he died, that you and Bubba would find another husband, uh, a father, and you were furious, uh, you know, outraged about that. Um, did you feel like Chris felt like he was replaceable? At that time, he did. Mm -hmm. You know, at that time, he really did. And he was a younger guy, and we didn't have our daughter yet. And I think what happened, and I, and I, I really do understand in a lot of ways what he was saying. I think my anger was not... It was more a great pain mm. to think that he didn't value mm. himself enough or that he didn't realize what all he meant to me. But looking back and after having more conversations with him, I do understand because I've had similar experiences in watching my friends become widows before I was one mm. and recognizing that we could go home from a funeral and stop at the grocery store on the way home. Not that we didn't care, but, you know, we needed eggs to eat in the morning or whatever. Right, right. And we could be hurting and still taking care of business. And somebody's life was just completely destroyed. Ah. And we could be there for them. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's, you know, but if 
in the moments that we weren't there physically in their house, we still were taking care of our life. And I can understand and have compassion for how he felt that he would see guys die on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And he also saw that everybody else's life went on. Mm -hmm. And he saw that the widow survived and that the parents survived. And that they found a way to heal their pain. And in some ways, maybe that made it easy. And in some ways, easier for him. But in some ways, maybe that made it really confusing. And in, and in other ways, I mean, I'm aware of it now. I'm aware of the fact that if God, you know, if God forbid something were to happen to me, it terrifies me for my children. But I also know they'll survive. Hmm. I don't, you know, I don't want that to be their life sure. for their sake. And, and certainly not for mine, although I also believe you live on and you get to watch the whole thing play out if you're the one that passes. But um, but the ones left behind are the ones that hurt. Yeah. Uh, you, you talk about coping with Chris re-enlisting um, after two deployments. Mm -hmm. What was the emo What was the feeling? I know that this is a common thread for many, many military spouses and just knowing how the brotherhood and how committed um, their soldier is to that mission and yet the tension between that and the family how did you get through that you know i there are a few things one is on his third deployment i remember him saying if you want me to get out i will and me saying i can't be the one to do that mm -hmm. i can't be the one to say it and i did i did let him know that it, things would change for me if he did, because I would, I would see things in a different light, whether I wanted to or not. I think I had that awareness, but I prayed that God would do what was best for us in the long term as a family. And I left that up to God and I was very faithful about that. So that when he did decide to reenlist, if I said I was going to have the faith and I was going to have the faith. And so I remember, you know, going on a walk with one of my friends and we had the kids in the stroller, you know, and we were talking and just saying, I ask God to lead and I have to believe that he is. And I don't understand how this can be best for our family in the long run, but I'm going to believe that it is. And, and I, I wish sometimes, I wish oftentimes that I had the wisdom that I have today back then. Hmm. And I think that's common too. I think we yeah. all wish, you know, sure. oh, if I'd only known then, you know, <laughs> I don't know. But part of that would have been Chris felt very passionately about his life at home and he felt very passionately about his life with the guys. And he wasn't this over communicator, you know? Mm -hmm. He, I knew he felt a sense of purpose, but I didn't understand everything behind that. When he would get home and I'd say, do you want to invite so-and-so or some of the guys over? He's like, no, babe, I live with them all the time. Like, <laughs> I just want to be with you and the kids. <laughs> and so there was a part of that brotherhood that I didn't get to see as intimately as I see it now. Yeah. So. Now that he's gone and I see that they bring that attitude of brotherhood to our family, meaning they don't ever leave us behind, meaning they have genuine love for us. And and I say that with a smile because when Chris was alive, I sometimes thought, do these guys hate me? Like they hardly ever talk to me. I'm trying to make conversation. <laughs> right. And what I've learned since is it was like, no, dude, if, if Chris is standing right there, there's going to be no misunderstanding. We want nothing <laughs> to do with your wife, man. Like all we want to do is just hang out. Like we will barely acknowledge her so that we're very clear that, uh, and it, you know, I laugh about it, but I didn't know that. It's not like anybody told me that, right. but now I see that they are, they're like brothers to me. Hmm. They still want nothing to do with me in an inappropriate way, which is great. I mean, right. I don't want either, sure. but, but I also see that they're very, um, they have a level of love and understanding for another wife or widow hmm. that not very many people have because I feel like that that um commitment to not leaving a man behind and that commitment to saying I would die for you translates to if something happens to you I will sacrifice whatever it is to take care of your family that's a promise they make to each other and it's wow I think it's a very ancient art actually of a warrior but to let somebody know fight with everything you've got because if something happens to you, I got your back. I'll take care of your family. Yeah. yeah. Wow. How, how do you respond to the people who've criticized Chris because of the war he fought in? You know, I think that's so interesting, a little bit disturbing, but I find that people, the more you talk to them about it, the more you talk it through with them, that it's important for us to never forget when our warriors sign up to serve, they sign up and say, I'll give you my life 
and you send me wherever you want. Mm -hmm. I don't get to say if I agree with the war. I don't get to say if I want to go to that country. Position that you're assigning me in the military. I'll just do it and I'll give my life to you while I'm doing it. What what trust is that? You know, I I think sometimes who would I go to today and say, I'm going to give you my life. My life is in your hands. You tell me what to do, where to go and how to do it. And I'll do it because I love you that much. Go for it. I could die doing it, but go like, you know, it really is that we lose sight of that sometimes that that is actually what they're saying when they sign on the dotted line. Right. Wow. What has helped you keep going since Chris's death? Really, it's it's my faith, uh, first and foremost. But I, my faith wouldn't be what it is today without the encouragement of other people in my life mm. who can help me see it or who I've been able to go directly to and ask the questions, who randomly send me things. And and my friends who said, have said to me, Taya, you, it's okay if you fall in the ditch. It's okay. Mm-hmm. We're not going to let you stay there. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I value that so much because trust me, I've been in the ditch a number of times and I've been where I'm, you know, laying in bed with the covers pulled over my head thinking, I can't, I don't want to do it. I, I can't get up again. And sometimes they say, then stay in bed. Yeah. We got you tomorrow. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, what can I do to help? Right. Or, or the friends that, I'm very aware that while we all want to do something to help somebody else, that sometimes the best thing you can do is to just show up. You don't have to, you don't have to take any further action than that. Just show up. It's, it's the people that I have a friend who I love it. Cause she'll come over and she'll kind of look at me as sort of like a, a litmus test. Where are we today? And if we're joking, we're joking. And if we're just quiet staring at the floor, we're quiet mm-hmm. staring at the floor, yeah. whatever it is, yeah. it's just showing up. So I yeah. think that's, a cool lesson that I've learned too. Well, you know, as I read this, I mean, you're an incredibly strong woman. I mean, multiple times as I read through that, just holding it together when I think all of us would say, there's no way I would have been able to hold it together. And that's been my experience. I've worked with hundreds and literally thousands of um, military families. The wives of these soldiers are just incredibly strong. And yet I think you give us a glimpse in the book that though that was important, part of the healing process was allowing um, to, to not necessarily feel like I have to have it all together. Would you right. agree with that? I mean, what, what play, what part did that play in this healing process? Cause I think a lot of um, spouses feel like I got to hold it together, even though there's so much pain under the surface. It's so true. And you know, it's, that's one of the talks I gave, I don't remember even what city, but there was a first responder wife who came up and she said that when she watched the movie American sniper and she said there was a part where Sienna is crying and says, but I need you. I need you here. Mm. And she said, she said, I've, I've felt the same thing and I've said the same thing, but I've never told anyone that because I've been ashamed of it. And I get that. You know, I think that's why people don't talk because we want to be more patriotic. We want to be stronger. Right. We want to mm. never put our own needs out there. But the truth of the matter is we, we've all had those conversations. And I think part of the healing process is knowing that that's okay. It's okay not to be perfect. I don't think anybody understands how to do this life well. I think we're getting there because we're talking about it more as a society. Yeah. And we're we're breaking down the barriers of that secret shame that we all carry, the warriors, the wives. You know, that whole dynamic is becoming something that at least we can talk about. But it is, it's one of those very... Um, it's one of those very difficult things to navigate when you know that all you have is your strength and you don't ever want to show a crack in that. Cause for me, I've been very afraid that if it cracks, it might crumble. Hmm. There's no guarantee I'll, I'll get it back. And that's, hmm. I think what, what I find strength in with my friends who have said, it's okay to crack. Yeah. It's yeah. okay to cry until you vomit, you know, like, yeah. we'll clean it up yeah. and, and we'll, we'll keep going. And that's been a, a really, a difficult process for me because like the otherwise I just I want to be strong enough to not let anything get me down I want to be brave enough to not shy away from anything and yet we're human yeah. and, and especially when we're tired which most of us are exhausted because we're trying so hard like <laughs> right. everybody in this world you know right. to keep up and we can't we can't do it all we have to be okay with we have to be okay with that yeah yeah 
at the end of the book, you really talk about this, um, all the pain that you've walked through has birthed something new and beautiful. Um, and, and it's the, the foundation that you've named after yeah, your, your husband. And, and then even just the element of the frog. I think that was so fascinating to, to read that and see how it has, um, you know, been, become part of this legacy. Right. Tell us a little bit about the foundation and, and your mission behind that. Well, it really, it's one of those things where I do feel like it was kind of a divine intervention because Chris was working on this logo before he was killed. And the guys who were designing it came to me and said, we just, we want to continue it at no charge and you know, all that stuff. And we were talking about a foundation and I thought there is no way, there's no way I can do that when I'm in these legal battles and grieving and all the other things. Well, long story short, as much as I said, well, I don't know that I can do that because of, I felt like God would put a person in my life at the right time to say, Oh no, you can do it. And then I'd say, well, okay, that's good. But what about this? And it was like, problem solved, problem solved. And all of a sudden it was like, okay, wow. I'm listening. We have a foundation, but the mission is to, to honor God and country by serving families who serve. And in the Bible, it says to put God first, to put your marriage second and to put your kids third, because in that order, the kids are happier and healthier. The marriage is happy and healthy, you know, and your faith is happy mm-hmm. and healthy. And so I, that's sort of the, the blanket statement of what we're doing. And then the nuances are all based on the things that I learned in my life with Chris and it's very emotional when we, we do revitalization retreats is Mm -hmm. one of our big things. And it's always so emotional when I am able to, to take the support that we've gotten from other people and to present it to somebody because number one, it it makes my heart full to be able to do it. Number two, usually they're crying because they're people of service. They're not used to being served. And number three, I know what that would have meant to us. And you know, it's just a, it's a very, beautiful emotional part of the whole thing but um it also makes me feel like even though somebody can take chris's body from this earth they can't take his spirit Mm -hmm. and it reminds me every day that if you live a good life somebody can carry your torch Mm -hmm. and your good life will live on even if you don't and i find that comforting yeah absolutely i mean the ripple effect of that is uh, unbelievable yeah. Well, we are so honored to have you on this show. We also are so honored to have you come and share uh, in Bellevue on November 20th. I'm so excited to have um, just this story shared with the community that I know many, many can relate to. Um, they find themselves in that journey as well. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time. And, and this is just, again, we're talking about Taya's book, American Wife. And uh, we'll have all the details of this underneath the video. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to being out there. And it's the Pacific Northwest. I That's know. Where I grew up. That's kind of cool. I know. Was it Portland? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I actually lived in Portland for a number of years. Okay. Very good. It's beautiful. So, well, we look yes. forward to seeing you soon. Okay. Well, thank All you right. for taking the time. Uh-huh. We appreciate it.